Libby and Pat, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, it's good to be together on this first Sunday in September. September, maybe because I spent so much of my life as a student, uh, September is all, or a teacher, September has always been uh, a time of excitement for me, a time of a feeling of a really uh, welcome, slight chill in the air and a little bit of a uh, frisson of good things to come. Uh, there will be a lot of good things happening here at Pilgrim this September. Uh, we'll tell you more about them in the, um, uh, during the announcements. I also want to point out, uh, thanks to hard work by Jim Fay, um, we've now got a screen showing the Zoom pictures in the sanctuary. So this way, not only will the people on Zoom be able to see what's going on in the sanctuary, but uh, the people in the sanctuary will be able to see the people on Zoom and we're hoping that that will create a, a greater feeling of uh, togetherness, inclusion, and uh, uh, a regular service. So uh, thank you, Jim, for that. And now um, let's turn our minds to prayer and let me ask Lee, our liturgist, to begin our worship. Good morning. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 146. Praise to our God, praise to our God, O oh my soul. I will praise God as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in our God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Our God sets the prisoners free. Our God opens the eyes of the blind. Our God lifts up those who are bowed down. Our God loves the righteous. Our God will reign forever for all generations. Praise be to our God. And now the invocation. Loving God, you have created us unfinished. We always have room to grow. You offer us guidance every day of our lives, drawing us ever closer to your commandments and to your ways. Throughout our lives, May we add to your creation and bring the world closer to fulfillment by showing the deepest love for you, for ourselves, and for all humanity. Amen.
The scripture today comes from Mark 7, verses 24 to 31. It's a story about Jesus that has its controversial sides to it, but uh, it's uh, one that is often discussed and preached. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. Well, our reading today from Mark's gospel brings us face to face with Christianity's central mystery about Jesus. How can a person at the same time be both fully human and fully divine? And what does the combination of humanity and divinity in Jesus tell us about how we ordinary, non-divine, certainly imperfect human beings are to live our own lives? As our story today begins, Jesus is traveling in the area of Tyre, far to the northwest of Jerusalem, in what is today southern Lebanon. Tyre was outside the Jewish part of the Holy Land. Its residents were from the Syro-Phoenician ethnic group. They were not Jews, but Gentiles. And there was in fact a history of animosity between the Syro-Phoenicians and the Jewish ethnic groups. Jesus hopes to travel through the area of Tyre without a attracting notice to himself, but this proves to be impossible. His fame as a healer apparently has spread even to this distant Gentile area. A Syrophoenician woman approaches Jesus and bows down before him. The woman is distraught because her daughter, who was at home, apparently had become possessed by a demon. The woman begs Jesus to heal her daughter, to exorcise the demon from her. We don't get to do a lot of exorcisms in the UCC. It's uh, it's a, it's a shortcoming. All right. Jesus' response to the woman is harsh and shocking. He refuses to heal the woman's daughter. He explains that he has been sent to heal only the children of Israel, but the woman before him is a Gentile. Jesus asks rhetorically, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Jesus' response is truly ethnocentric. It may represent the moral low point of Jesus's life. But then the Syrophoenician woman fights back. She says to Jesus, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus has a change of heart. He says to the woman, for saying that, 
I will heal your daughter. Even now, the demon has left her. And Jesus and the woman part company. Jesus travels back toward the east, back to the Jewish area of Galilee. In this story, Jesus' initial reaction of the Syrophoenician woman on the basis of her, of her ethnicity is far from divine. Instead, Jesus is succumbing to a very human tendency, which has sadly always been present in our genetic makeup. We all possess in our DNA, in our DNA, genes which date back to the dawn of the human species that induce us to favor in our behavior people we think are likely to be closely related to us genetically. This tendency is called by biologists kin selection. Kin selection is seen not only among humans, of course, but also among the many animals that live in herds, flocks, insect colonies, and other genetically based groupings. We basically inherited the instinct from our pre-human evolutionary ancestors. The human instinct toward kin selection has some beneficial effects, notably in helping to induce human beings to care for their young. But the human tendency to favor one's own self-perceived in-group and even to be hostile to members of other groups, as Jesus in our story initially was to the Syrophoenician woman, has been the source of so much suffering, so much evil throughout the course of human history. The Bible itself tells the history of countless ethnic wars and ethnically based slavery. And of course, even today, ethnic conflict and ethnic oppression remain present throughout the world. The tragedy of kin selection has in fact increased over time as the world has grown smaller and people from different ethnic groups interact more often. Now, kin selection is certainly not the only genetic influence on human behavior. In addition to genes favoring kin selection, there are also genes that promote altruism toward other human beings, including even strangers. There are plenty of instances of people risking their lives to assist even total strangers. The instinct toward altruism, like that toward kin selection, has an evolutionary purpose. The instinct toward altruism helps the human species to achieve cooperation and therefore makes it more likely that the human species will survive. The instinct toward altruism coexists in our genetic makeup, genetic makeup with the instinct toward kin selection and sometimes the two instincts conflict, leaving us confused. This confusion is typical of much of our moral decision-making. We are all subject in many aspects of our lives to conflicting tendencies that are at least in part influenced by our genetic makeup. In any given situation, some of our tendencies might tend to lead us to good moral choices and others of our tendencies might tend to lead us in the wrong moral direction. Godly behavior doesn't always come to us without a struggle. In so many areas of our lives, we must recognize both the beneficial and harmful behavioral tendencies to which we're subject, and we must take control of our minds to reach good overall decisions. This seems to be exactly what Jesus did in changing his mind about helping the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus began with a bad decision based on kin selection. He later overrode that bad decision with a better decision based on God's command to love others, based on the principle of altruism. When we think about Jesus, who our faith tells us was both fully human and fully divine, we have a natural tendency to try to deny that Jesus was really fully human, to deny that Jesus really was subject to human weakness or even to human imperfection. From the earliest period of Christianity, there's been a heresy called docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, which holds that Jesus only pretended to be human, that in fact, he was solely divine. For example, the docetists believe that Jesus didn't truly suffer on the cross. He only pretended to suffer. Docetism takes all meaning out of God's incarnation as a human being, and docetism therefore has been recognized as a heresy for almost 2000 years. The story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, I think, is meant to tell us that contrary to the docetists, Jesus was fully human, in addition to being fully divine. When confronted with his human instinct toward kin selection, 
he didn't immediately reject this instinct. Instead, Jesus had to struggle to overcome the ungodly aspects of our human nature and break through to the command of love. The human being Jesus needed to consult the divine Jesus in order to understand how to act toward the Syrophoenician woman. In so many aspects of our lives, in caring for ourselves and in interacting with family and friends, in our lives in the marketplace and in our roles as citizens and voters, in so many aspects of our lives, we need to sort out, as Jesus did in today's story, the conflicting impulses that our human nature presents to us. The goal every time is to discern which of our impulses, which of our possible actions are consistent with the great commandment, the commandment of love for God, for ourselves, and for our fellow human beings, just as Jesus needed to consult the, the great commandment in choosing to act from love and compassion toward the Syrophoenician woman. We might be tempted to say that it's unfair to expect us ordinary people to act as readily as Jesus seems to act in the story in rejecting his exclusivist and ungodly first inclination and instead choosing to follow his inclination to obey the great commandment. After all, the godly side of Jesus's nature is right there inside him, easy for him to access. We might argue that we, who are fully human but not fully divine, should be given greater scope for bad behavior. We shouldn't be held to the standard of what Jesus would do. That would be to subject us ordinary human beings to an excessively high standard. Instead of a standard of what Jesus would do, maybe it should be enough that we ordinary human beings behave as well as, say, the average person. And if that leaves us with a world full of eccentricity, with all the violence and hatred that entails, so be it. After all, we're only human. I'm of course being facetious when I suggest it might be unfair to hold us, might be unfair to hold us to a godly standard of behavior. I think the story of the Syrophoenician woman is telling us that our standard for ourselves should be that of Jesus in the Bible when he decides to help the Syrophoenician woman. His first reaction was hasty, influenced much too heavily by the inbred human tendency toward kin selection. Jesus then reconsidered, however, and he was able to incorporate God's great commandment, the principle of love and altruism, into his decision-making. If the fully human Jesus could do this, so can we. And Jesus reached his decision to help the Syrophoenician woman based on the kinds of decision-making techniques that we're all capable of using. He used his reason to compare his initial tentative decision with the great commandment which he had been taught as a child. And he could also test his decision, just as we can test our own decisions, through communion, through mysterious communion with God. Jesus could test in prayer and contemplation whether his final decision to help the woman felt consistent with the way God desires the world to work. Jesus could experience the tranquil reassurance that his decision was in harmony with God's overriding commandment of love. And though Jesus did through his divinity have a unique relationship with God, there is no reason why we ordinary human beings can't make our moral decisions using exactly the same process. Like Jesus, we have the ability to question our initial unthought reactions to moral questions and to test these reactions by reference to God's law, by reference to the great commandment. And like Jesus, we have all been granted the ability to communicate mysteriously with God, to test at the level of our feelings, of our emotions, whether our moral decisions are in fact consistent with God's command of love. In all our relationships with ourselves and everyone else in our lives, we should apply the decision-making process that Jesus apparently followed in the story of the Syrophoenician woman. We won't do so perfectly and unerringly, we are, after all, only fully human. We are not also fully divine. But by consistently applying the tools of reason and of communion with God to our moral decision-making, we will help bring, bring the world ever closer to one in which we transcend our more harmful instincts, a world that is full of justice, well-being, and love. Amen.
Now today, this Sunday is another opportunity for us to give offerings that make this a better world. As you depart, you'll find a collection plate at the back on the left side, and you're asked to give generously and with joy. For those at home watching this by Zoom, please send in your pledges and your donations to Pat Pillsbury, our financial secretary. Accept, O oh God, these offerings which your people give today and grant your blessing for the use to which these funds will be spent to promote peace and goodwill throughout the world. Amen. Now is the time in our service when we share prayers for one another, for the world, uh, our joys and concerns. Is there anyone who'd like to begin this morning with a joy or a concern?
Oh, Donna. I would like to ask for prayers for our brothers and sisters in Louisiana and in the greater New York City area who've just experienced so much horror with um, the hurricane this last week and just prayers for um, strength and a way to calm tempers um, and just um, try to get through this with, with as much calm as is possible. Prayers for all who have suffered, for all who have died and all who have suffered from Hurricane Ida and its aftermath uh, all up and down the Eastern United States. Uh, and also prayers that we as a nation and as a world will be able to uh, confront the uh, problem of global warming, which seems to have uh, helped to fuel the destruction and the death uh, in, over the last few days. Thank you very much, Donna. Yes. I ask for prayers for Pat Swanson and the Swanson family as they grieve the death of Dean Swanson suddenly on August 12th. It's a sudden and shock to all of us who knew him so well. It seems so unfair to have my best friend die at only age 72. I'm sure that all of you saw this obituary, which has been run every day this week in the Washington Post. I want to tell you some things about my best friend. Dean was from St. Paul, Minnesota, where his father was a professor of agriculture at the University of Minnesota. Dean was the, old, the second oldest of four children that his parents had. He had an older brother, Dale, who died about three years ago from a stroke. And he has a younger sister, Janet, and the youngest child, Charlie. They were here in uh, July to visit him. And that, I'm told, was a wonderful reunion. Dean, after college, married Pat, and I believe it was on a scholarship that he went, he and Pat, for a couple of years to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where he got his master's degree in international relations. Coming back from that, he looked for a job and he got one with the government. He was assigned to the fisheries division of the Department of Commerce. And there for his entire career until he retired at age 66, six years ago, he had probably the best job I've ever heard of. He went as a key person to negotiate fishing rights and treaties and agreements all over the world with all the world's nations. And he spent years working on international agreements to limit and outlaw the fishing for whales. He continued that visiting countries all over the world. And he's seen certainly more than you and I have ever seen. 
He was particularly good at his job, a smart and dedicated person with many, many talents. After he retired, he decided that he would dedicate his life to being a volunteer and activist. As you know, he worked two days at the Mana Food Center every week. And on weekends, he worked as a volunteer at the Trolley Museum, first collecting tickets and cleaning the trolley cars. And later he worked up to being a driver and conductor and he really enjoyed driving the trolleys. As for vacations, early in his life, when he was a youngster, his father was sent to Paris. And I believe there he helped the French institute new methods of farming. So he had several years in Paris and Dean remembered that very, very well and loved Paris all his life. And in the second half of his career, he spent all his vacations in Paris, usually 10 days. And he always traveled, traveled or tried to when it was Bastille Day in July. So he saw all the great parades. Dean and I have been close friends for many years. He was the best man at my wedding here in 2000, a correction in 1991, 30, <laughs> 30 years ago when I married Marcia here in this church. And uh, we had dinners out at various restaurants, Dean and I, on Friday nights. So there must have been at least over the years, 200 of those. Dean was dedicated to Pilgrim Church and making it a go in the right direction as he saw the way to lead it. He set the example for all of us in making this our church. He served as an institutional representative for years in addition to the other duties that he had on the boards and committees and as moderator. And he loved that. He loved representing this church and he served on the boards for the Central Atlantic Conference and the Potomac Association. He was an activist for the community and for the church affairs. He and I worked on several projects together. Besides being an institutional rep, he worked diligently for Springville Terrace and organized teams to go there and help and particularly decorate at Christmas time. He worked with an organization down in the district and he organized teams, cleaning teams to go to senior citizens' homes and apartments and clean them. And I went on several of those cleaning projects with him. And as I mentioned, he worked at MANA two times a week. And on certain weeks where they were really short, he worked even more in the trolley museum. And uh, he got me interested in the work at MANA. And uh, I led teams out there to sort many times the donations of canned goods and box goods that were donated by the major food chains and from individuals. 
he was interested in making sure that we had a active and well-run Sunday school. And he taught over the years, many, many times. He and I both taught the third through the fifth grade classes. He spent six months working on the church constitutional review committee with me and others. And last, these last years, he worked on the mission and service board on their projects and led many of them. Dean was an outstanding human being with drive and commitment to making this a better world. I will miss and grieve for him for a long time. Thank, thank you so much for that, Lee. Uh, we certainly pray for comfort and healing for uh, Pat, uh, Dean's wife, for um, the, the entire Swanson family, and for Lee, uh, who uh, has shared with us the intensity of humanity that uh, Dean had, and uh, the true love that uh, Dean had for all of his fellow human beings. And uh, Lee, we, again, really appreciate your sharing your thoughts and, and your emotions with us. Thank you. Yes. Okay. We have one that came in online uh, from Robin. Prayers for those struggling with mental health difficulties. It is difficult to find and receive treatment, especially at this time of COVID. Yes, very, very important. Thank you so, so much, Robin. Uh, this has been a time when mental health services have been a bit overwhelmed. It's, it's difficult to find, uh, to find the necessary care. And we pray for strength for all those suffering from mental illness that, that will be able to navigate this period of time and uh, achieve wellness. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, then let's pray for all of our concerns and give thanks for all of our joys. All of the items that were perhaps not mentioned today out loud, but nevertheless uh, reside deeply in our hearts. And let's pray also for the families of all those who have died and for all who have been injured or forced to suffer trauma and fear as a result of the recent events in Afghanistan. We pray for peace, for love, and for true justice in Afghanistan, the kind of peace, love, and justice that all the peoples of the world deserve. We, we pray fervently for the flourishing of democracy and justice here in America and around the world. May the United States be an example to the world in our protection of human dignity and equality for all. We pray for all who have been affected by the pandemic we pray for the rapid spread of vaccination here in the United States, and we pray for greater availability of vaccines in the poor countries of the world. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris, and for all who exercise political and judicial authority in this country, that they may fulfill their duties wisely and caringly. We pray for an end to gun violence in our country, and saddened by the losses in, in Afghanistan, we pray for the members of our armed forces around the world and for all veterans. God protect our, crew, our troops wherever they serve. We pray for the end of civil violence in South Africa. May the people of South Africa with its troubled history and its beauty be granted peace and well-being. We pray for the elimination of racism here in the United States and everywhere it is found. Racism causes so much pain and suffering and also threatens our democracy. Racism is a threat to everyone. It must be overcome. It must be driven decisively from this country's culture and soul. We pray that people may be freed from poverty and oppression wherever they exist in the world, whether in other countries or here at home. And we ask protection and comfort for refugees and for all other immigrants. And we pray for our church. May this always remain a place where we can join together for prayer, 
fellowship and works of charity and love. For all these things, God of love, we humbly and sincerely pray. And now let's join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and over our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And now is the time in our service when we join in communion and hold the communion. Uh, this is a, a very important time, uh, a time when we devote our attention and our souls to communicating with, to accessing the uh, voice, the presence, the warmth, the guidance, the love that, that we know in our God. And uh, it's uh, complicated when we are in a hybrid mode where we're not all in the same place, but it really isn't that complicated. Um, we are all together at the same moment doing the same thing. And uh, let's, we should be thankful for that. So almighty God, from many places, you have gathered us around Christ's holy table. We come to feast together, renew us and make us one. Amen. One of the greatest gifts Jesus gave to us when he lived on this earth was his table ministry, a ministry that broke the social and religious conventions of his time to welcome every person, no matter who they were or where they were on life's journey to the table. He did this so all God's people could understand God's extravagant welcome God's gift of unmerited grace and God's unconditional love. Jesus did this so we could understand that our God is a God who feeds us body, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus did this so that we might have a taste of the goodness of God's realm and be hung so hungry for more that we as a community begin to build that realm right here on earth with the Holy Spirit as our guide. We rejoice in God's welcome. We are grateful for God's grace. We are sustained by God's love, and we eagerly await the taste of God's realm that we find at this table. Jesus felt so passionately about his table ministry that even when his life was in danger, even when he knew he was going to the cross to be killed, still he took one final moment to dine with his followers. During this meal, Jesus told his followers they were not his servants, but they were now his friends and co-laborers in his ministry. Jesus asked his friends to continue building God's world and to continue welcoming all people to God's table. During the meal, Jesus took the bread they were eating. He asked a blessing for it and then broke it and gave it to those at the table, knowing that bread like our lives must be broken to be shared. Jesus said, take and eat for this broken bread is the bread of life, which is my body. Then he took a cup of wine, blessed it, and passed it around, saying, This is the seal of the new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of me and all that I have taught you. And so we now, now we eat, we drink, we remember, and we rejoice that Jesus Christ laid down his life so that we might find ours. Amen. Now please come to the table, for all things are ready. Let us take the bread of heaven. And the cup of salvation. Now we, we give thanks. We thank you, God for the gift of sharing bread and cup with our brothers and sisters in your presence. Although we join this communion today from different places, we know that your spirit knows no boundaries and that it binds us together with each other and with you as fully as if we were sitting together in one room. May our communion meal sustain us as we seek to live our lives faithfully and may we always be deeply aware of your presence. Thanks be to God, amen.
And now, I think there'll be a fair number of them. Uh, it's time for announcements. Uh, would anyone like to start? And I'm gonna put my mask back on. Good morning. I just want to remind everyone that next week's service will start at 1030 back to our normal time and it is homecoming and there's a lot of announcements I know related to homecoming. Um, we will be having fellowship following the service outside in the parking lot similar to um, what do they call that uh, tailgating. So um, <laughs> maybe not as rowdy, but uh, please feel free to bring um, some chairs to sit near your vehicle so we can stay social distanced while we eat. There'll be um, cake and hot dogs and some other treats. So even if you do not come to the service in person, please plan to come and park outside and um, enjoy in some fellowship with us uh, afterwards. Also, next week will be Reverend Michael's, my, Ms. Reverend Michael Vanacore's first um, service here. He'll be starting uh, next Sunday, and that's very, I'm very excited. I've been having lots of conversations. I think you guys will all learn to um, love him and uh, respect him like I have over these weeks dealing with him. Um, in anticipation of uh, him coming, especially in the time of COVID, Penny has agreed to be our editor uh, um, of the directory to add little snapshots of each of us by our names so that it'll be easier for him to get to know us with all the masks kind of covering our faces and um, us being, you know, many of us still remaining remote and not being in the church. So please, if you can send pictures of yourselves, and I know I haven't yet either because I'm still trying to, to find a recent one. She didn't want one from 20 years ago. So uh, <laughs> Now I have to, now I really have to find one uh, that's uh, reasonable to send. We'll use a selfie. I will. I'll take a selfie if that's what I have to do. So take a selfie and just forward it to it. And uh, what my kids teach me that the best selfies are from above so that you get really good pictures of yourself. So try that. Um, and just text it to Penny or email it to her. Okay. So she can put that into the directory. So thank you, Penny, for taking that on. I really appreciate it. Michelle, did you have anything else? Oh, homecoming slideshow. Yes, um, our summer photos for the times when we were, were not in church. Or, and, and honestly, I think we could go back even further since we haven't seen each other for quite a while. But send in your pictures um, to Stephanie, um, or you're welcome to send them to me too. I'll be helping her put the slideshow together. Um, I know that Michelle's been proactively going through Facebook and requesting the rights to photos to put into the slideshow, but please send in your pictures so that we can have a nice robust picture show to put um, up next week. Did I miss anything for homecoming? Okay, great, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, on behalf of Lisa and, and myself, we're now the um, co-superintendents of Sunday School, and we're very excited. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're very excited to have um, on next Saturday, September 11th, um, you should have received an evite. The time has been changed to 3.30 rather than two o'clock to have the, our youngest, young pilgrims and their families join with Miss Betty and Pastor Mike and Miss Lisa and myself on the patio um, of the church so that we can have a blessing of the backpacks, which has been a traditional event at Pilgrim for a number of years and followed by an ice cream social. So if, if you have not responded to your evite, please do that as soon as you can so we know how much ice cream to have on hand for everybody. Um, 
given that, that the children have not yet been vaccinated, we, we would like everybody to wear masks, but we will be outside. Um, hopefully we'll have good weather and certainly we'll have good fellowship. So looking forward to seeing um, our young pilgrims and your families. Thanks. Let me just say, uh, this is something that I have looked forward to for many years of doing the blessing of the backpacks. Now, not only the backpacks, but you as doctors, your, your bag you carry with you, you as teachers, you as lawyers, you bring your backpack. And as I said to Jay Wickham, bring your construction belt. And let's bless that because people we really need have all these things blessed. So I am looking for a big crowd and I will be prepared for you on Saturday at 3.30. I think it's appropriate on this last Sunday of Reverend Durst to be our full-time minister to say thank you. And I know all of you do because over the last 10 minutes, 10 months, after the abrupt departure of Reverend Jen, he stepped in and filled the shoes very, very well. I think he's done a wonderful job, and I think you agree. Let's give him applause. Thank you, Lee, and everyone. Uh, these past 10 months have been among the most fulfilling of my life. I, uh, I, I, as I said in the newsletter, I, I just feel so lucky to be among this incredibly fine group of people. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to, to Michael, Reverend Michael's arrival. Uh, he seems like a great guy. And uh, I'll, we've already talked, uh, we'll be working together. Uh, I'll do whatever I can to assist him and uh, remain, uh, uh, a very enthusiastic part of this, this community. Th thank you so much. Continuing in the vein of positivity, um, I opened some mail this today and uh, found that um, the, we have, our Paycheck Protection Program loan was paid off. At, uh, it, essentially, it's not been paid off, but they excused it, um, uh, which was the purpose of the program in the first place. If you recall, we received approximately $19,000 in what was characterized as a loan. Um, and uh, we had to go through a lot of machinations <laughs> in order to get the loan excused, but we finally were able to do that. So um, that's one less issue that we have to deal with. And um, I'm very thankful that it finally occurred. That's, that's great, great work, Nancy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, As Nancy said, the loan business didn't work out simply, neither did our experiment with kind of bringing the Zoom people into the sanctuary. Uh, we had some technical glitches that we don't understand quite yet, but if you have any thoughts about whether or not we should continue trying to do this, one of our thoughts is to try to make a virtual choir appear in big picture uh, and some other things that will make the Zoom people and us who are here uh, work well together. And if you have thoughts about it one way or the other, uh, please let us know. Um, just wanted to announce that Mission Board will be meeting this coming Thursday evening at 8.30 via Zoom. Thanks. Can I add to that for Mission Board? Um, we, we lost Dean Swanson, so we need about four people to fill his shoes. <laughs> um, but he and Jack both left, so our board is a little shy. 
And this church has always been so generous about what it does in the community. So if anybody is not on a board, we certainly could use uh, another person. Thank you. Well, now let's go back into the world. Enjoy and Thanksgiving. We thank God for the incarnation, which shows us that even we imperfect human beings can live our lives according to God's laws of love and justice. As we have been commanded, may we deeply love God, ourselves, and all of humanity. And may God bless us and keep us. May God shine the divine light upon us. And may God grant us in all the world a full measure of God's peace. Amen.